Joining us right now is former House Speaker Paul Ryan. He is a partner at Solomir Capital and vice chair of Taneo. And uh, Paul, thank you for being here today. Morning. You have been pretty outspoken along the way uh, against former President Trump, even though you served during his administration, you served as House Speaker, went through a lot of these things. Today, you've got Nikki Haley bowing out. At least that's the word that we're getting on this. What, what does that mean for the for the race that's to come? Yeah, I mean, let's wait and see what Nikki says. I, I know that that's what she's going to do. She ran a great race. So first of all, I think I just want to commend Nikki. Uh, she gave people like me, you know, conservatives, a home. Um, she spoke to traditional conservatives in a very compelling way. She advanced our principles and highlighted and defended our principles quite well. But it just wasn't enough. She didn't, you know, she didn't capture you, the party. You think uh, she will? What is she going to do? I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I really don't know. Would what it she's make a do. difference to you? No, I, I, I make my own mind up. She makes hers. Uh, but I don't know what Nikki's going to do. But I'm glad she made the race. She she beat everybody else out in the field. She did a good job of representing, you know, traditional conservatives. I think Trump would be wise to listen to her about, you know, what it takes to appeal to traditional conservatives and moderate and centrists, the people who make the difference. It's the suburban voter that's going to make the difference in this race. Um, that's where Nikki did really, really well. That's where she was strongest. So I think she represents a cohort of voters in this country that are the swing pivotal voters. The word and so I think people would be wise to listen to what she has to say. I mean, the word is the Biden administration is hoping to court those very voters. Yeah, that's they, how they, they won this be, last time. Yeah, that, that's, that, that could be the swing that makes the difference. Yeah, the problem for Biden, from my perspective, is he's chased the wrong voters the last three and a half years. He went to the left. He chased... The, the suburban centrists in, say, Milwaukee, like my old congressional district, they voted for him thinking he was going to be a moderate. That's not what he was on all of the issues. You know, and stack up the issues. They, other than maybe life, uh, I think seven out of ten issues, the top ten issues, stack up for Republicans. And it's because Biden gave those issues away and went hard left. And that's a mistake he made. And I think they're, they're ruining that day right now. What do you think Nikki Haley's calculus should be right now? in terms of what, what she tries to do? Should, should she try to get back in the fold? Should, yeah, she, I, should she be the next Liz Cheney and just I go on cable TV for... She, Nikki's a friend. The last thing I want to do is on TV what, tell what, her what she should do. But for her political uh, future, what, what do you think is, is right for her Be to true do? to herself and, and, and speak to her values and, and, so and don't, her beliefs. Then don't endorse Donald Trump. I, I don't know what she's going to do. But, no, but if no, I were... Do think just do what, she, do what she feels right for herself, her conscience, her gut. And uh, who cares about your political future? When you start making all these calculations about your political future, that's when you start making bad decisions, in my opinion. At, at this stage of the game, at this stage of life, and at this level of politics. Real-world decisions, though, too. That, that yeah, but real-world decisions matter, and your conscience matters. And, and maybe she could... I don't, I don't know what she's going to do, but the last thing I want to do is tell her what she did. She'd do, no offense, Joe, through television. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's fair. We... we are still many, many months away. I think somebody said yesterday, 35 weeks away from the presidential election. This could be the longest I would in have, probably modern history. Yeah. Yeah. It, I would argue that election fatigue is already here for oh, a large God, portion yeah. of Americans. I'm in that 70% camp. <laughs> who, who doesn't want either of these guys as the nominee? You know what? As a, since this is a policy-based show, my biggest concern is we'll probably have some kind of a debt crisis under the watch of the next president, during the next presidency. You know, once we're done cutting rates... All of these sovereigns out there, you know, all these first world countries that have the same problems we have, they have baby boomers and unfunded entitlements, they're all bringing debt to the markets. And it's not inconceivable that we could have an auction failure in, after we're done cutting rates, and then what? So the question in my mind is, what's the next person going to do? Both of these guys, Trump and Biden, are campaigning against doing anything about this. And we, we've That had, just really bothers me. It makes me really worried. We've had a bad precedent, too, because it, it seems like we're getting away with it. It's, the, yeah, the yeah. Debt. so that's why that and we've spawned waited, MNT 50 and all this years, stuff. People have been yeah, everybody kept when, thinking we could just push the string. When did Pete Peterson uh, and David Walker? That was like 20 years ago. I was well, passing budgets in Nothing's days. happened bad, though. I right. passed budgets back in those days when I was House Budget Chair to balance the budget, pay off the debt, means test, change the age you know, retirement age, all of those things. We all survived politically and lived to tell another, you know, lived another day. But nobody, everybody said, oh, this isn't a, this isn't a big problem. The, this, the this crisis isn't coming. Stock market's at all-time highs. Yeah. Um, interest rates are, and yeah. we got $34 trillion in debt and the GDP's growing at, you know, what no one thought and it could. And this is, this is compounding away from us ugly, in an ugly way. Another one point on interest rates gives yeah. us like $30 trillion over 10 years of debt. 
It's servicing right. costs. It's so really insane hope, stuff. Do you hope that Jay Powell today is going to say that rate cuts are coming? Or do you think... No, I, I'm in the higher, longer, was... for longer yeah, category. Yeah, I'm in the yeah, higher, for longer category. Get this thing under control. Uh, no cuts at all? No, I, I, look, data-driven. I agree with the data-driven thing, but I think that my worry is they'll probably cut at the end and they'll look political. Um, they have to worry about their independence, I think, that they, the Fed, especially with the... Reg I think we had McHenry on talking about all yeah, these regulations. Yeah, yeah. They got to worry about looking about their independence. Um, they have to f getting from eight to four percent inflation is a lot easier. Getting from four to two, and I think they need to make sure that they exhaust this to make sure that they have inflation under control. What, what worries me is if, if we if we have the specter of a debt crisis possibly on our you know medium term horizon, what can you do now? And there are a couple things I think Congress could do that they're discussing, like a debt commission. Get a debt commission formed. Get it in place. We had one of those. Simpson well, that was, that was not a statutory commission. I was on Simpson Bowles. Yeah. It was dead before. We, we literally saw the press release from Pelosi and Obama in our last meeting before we left the room saying we're not doing this, and then it was dead. So you can do debt commissions in a way like the Greenspan Social Security Commission where it's statutory, where Congress has to vote on it, can't avoid it. And you could set one of those up now so that they produce a, an outcome, a product in 2025. You could, you could pass stablecoin legislation so that you can get the dollar more deeply embedded in the global monetary system as we digitize, create more demand for our bonds, more buyers for our bonds like stablecoins do. I think there are a few things that are kind of in the ether on the table that Congress could do today to try and prepare for this moment, particularly given that both of these people who are running for president are, are campaigning against doing anything about this. What are the odds? So somebody in Congress should do I mean, something about this. You've seen what Congress can and can't get done at this point. What are the odds that any of this stuff gets picked up? These two things I just described are in the mix of decisions that they're going to be in the next two weeks deciding. They've got the first six bills coming to the floor this week. That was good. I think Mike Johnson deserves credit for getting this to the floor. I think they're going to get Ukraine done. It's going to. It may be ugly, but they're going to get it done. And then they have to do the rest of the appropriation bills. And that's the, the last train leaving the station, an that omnibus. That's done by March 22nd, right? Yeah. So yeah, they might kick weeks? the can a day or, or a week weeks. or so. Yeah, that's possible. But, but in that discussion are these things. People are, a lot of people, it's bipartisan, are pushing the debt commission. I think it's Manchin and Mitt and, and, a, and a bunch of House guys. Jordan Aaronstein, the budget chair in the House, kicked it out of committee. Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking for is are there policy things you can do today to prepare the country for, for what is likely to happen, which is some real problems. And what bothers me, back to the presidential, is none of these guys are proposing to do a damn thing about it.